Hi, so uh, I'm assuming everybody knows the name Adobe, but when you hear that, how many of you are thinking PDF and Photoshop? <laughs> a large portion, <laughs> which is what I suspected. Um, we've had been in the video business for a long time, but Adobe's always been a software company. So as the file-based transition has occurred and computers have gotten faster, our, our broadcast business has really grown. So um, you just take, for example, over the course of the last 18 months or so, over 100 broadcast entities have chosen Adobe as their backbone. So it's really been a growth area for us. So um, you know, don't worry about not knowing about it. So we'll give you a little bit of a grounding on uh, our, our position and what some of the things we're worried about. And a lot of them were touched on earlier. So uh, I've tried to weave some things in, including a little bit of video from earlier today. So we're going to start it off with a little video. This one's slightly dated. It's done from uh, our UK uh, team, and it has a lot of UK broadcasters and projects that you may not know that we've been involved in. So uh, we will start with a video. So just a little sampling, um, and, and Simon, who works with me, said, you know, we have to update this because we have so many great new customers that have started to use our software. So uh, very exciting to have customers do neat stuff with the things that you make. So starting off, uh, I've worked in sport broadcasting off and on for quite a while, going back to the 1994 Olympics where I worked with NRK and CTV. So, uh, you know, for a long time, sports broadcasting stayed the same. It was interesting hearing the panel discussion and all the things that are changing, and it's, you know, that darn British guy who invented the internet that caused all the problems. I've ch chased it down. So if you look at that, you know, one of the challenges we have is, you know, there's a little bit of a discussion around SD and HD and delivering to devices. But one of the challenges now, for 50 years, you really had like one resolution. It changed from black and white to color, but you had one thing to deliver. Now you got to deliver all over the place in every frame size. And having a global audience means that you've got a global problem. So the challenge gets much bigger. Um, who hears budgets go up to the exact amount you want every year? Just doesn't happen. So you always have to do it cheaper. You're getting more and more demands to deliver more things on a lower budget. And you know we've sort of you know danced around the edges of this social thing now, but you know sports is innately social because what happens is you have fans who are engaged. They're at the stadium or they're watching it at home, and it's in real time they can communicate their thoughts and feelings in a microblogging manner across their different platforms. Um, but you have to do all that and keep people engaged, keep the advertisers happy, and uh, it's challenging. So um, I'm going to include a couple little things here that might be of more of an interest. It's not going to be a focus of the presentation, but Adobe does a lot on distribution as well. So we just did a study recently, and one of the things about sport that's interesting is the devices. So when you want to watch something, for me, traveling over the weekend, I wanted to watch F1. So I was actually watching it on my phone with a 3G connection, so trying to make sure I could see some sport. And that was back to my sling box in Montreal, where I'm from. But one of the things you see is uh, device-based viewing of sports is growing incredibly. So these other screens become more important, because if you're engaged with a team or a sport, you want to see it. Uh, just some of the other research you might find interesting is uh, across the other media types. In the top left, you can see sports is the most popular. Uh, the devices that people are, you know, drawing it on, um, 
pretty common, as you'd see on the street, the mix of devices that you see with Apple being uh, very heavily represented there. So just a little, little background stuff before we dive into the uh, meat of the presentation. So one thing that's changed is the two ends of the spectrum, capture and delivery. So show of hands, who doesn't have a video-capable phone in their pocket today? Nobody. That's an interesting little, uh, little change. And one of the things that we found when we're talking with sports broadcasters, it's also an interest interesting area of engagement. If you think about everybody who's there at the this, this stadium watching the event has a camera. So they can actually tell their story. And there's a lot of stories in just getting to the event and watching the event. So actually this morning, well, uh, so just in the previous session, uh, we're playing around in this space. Again, it's not something we're going to focus on here, but I used a little app that we created called Video Haiku which helps people tell better stories because it constrains people into five-second shots. So it forces them to do very constrained, very simple storytelling. So here's just a little video I took this morning. There's Claire asking a tough question, and then the audience starting to respond. So I was able to add the text in, but I did this literally uh, almost in the time it took to shoot it. And I've added a little vignette look on it. So engaging the audience is another thing to think about. So what you want to do is you want to start thinking about how can my audience be part of this conversation and how can I create more engagement with my brand by allowing my audience to tell their stories as they come into this as well. Um, so that's just a little thing there. The delivery side, we know about. We know everybody's watching on every single thing and it's just going to get bigger and more and there's, you know, just while we're talking, 14 new formats and three new resolutions were invented. Um, the thing I find interesting though is those things we can kind of wrap our heads around. What's changed is really, for me, the middle part. So, you know, when I started in sports broadcasting, we thought about analog video moving through bespoke devices. It was a hardware age. You could think about a video stream going through a switcher, and you sort of, it was a time and a place thing. Then that all went digital, and we had digital streams, but it was still moving through devices. And the device may be something like a, uh, a workstation, but it was still about moving stuff around. But now, we've got pervasive connectivity. You know, I I as we look at what ADI has done with all these different locations, we want to remove the position of the media and the time of the media from the equation. So we want everybody to be able to get to everything all the time. And in doing so, you make the network the platform. So one of the things you're going to see this afternoon is we're going to start using a lot more light devices in the content creation process because you can. The computing becomes centralized, you make a dependency on the network, and you can completely change the way you build things. So this is kind of a mantra that we're going to rally around as we uh, talk about things today. But that is kind of the change in the ecosystem. More stuff captured than ever before, good. More stuff watched than ever before, good. Everything in the middle changing, a little frustrating, but also extremely exciting, and a lot of new possibilities come up. For those who don't know our products, we work in what we call a plan to playback, and I kind of mapped it to these three areas, allowing me to do that snazzy transition. Um, I'll just quickly walk you through the products. Um, you saw some of the things like Cords Nation Street and Emmerdale. All their script and all their planning is done in a, a package we have called Adobe Story, which is a hosted script writing package. You're going to see Prelude, which is ingesting the footage that you create, adding metadata, you know, qualitative metadata. Um, we also have uh, all of our creative tools, Premiere Pro for editing, after Effects, uh, the world's most widely used VFX and uh, motion graphics package. Audition for audio. Speed grade for color. That'll be more important. I'll explain why in a moment. And then when you deliver, uh, we can encode to whatever you want, whether it's you know, DNX for your plate error servers in the Avid world, whether it's MPEG, whether it's H.264, or the emer em uh, emerging H.265 standard for 4K HD. So those are our products. They fit into a plan to playback workflow. And as I mentioned, Adobe has two sides to the company, the content creation side, the digital media side, but we also have the marketing side of the company. So just walking through at the top, those are the products laid out in their sort of left to right plan to playback. Uh, we have deep collaboration with Anywhere, but you can also connect any of the Adobe products to the Creative Cloud, another topic we're not going to touch on today because this group represents more enterprises and they want to control exactly how they collaborate, and they want very deep collaborations. We'll talk about anywhere. We're going to talk about partners, both uh, primarily today in the software world, but we have hardware partners. And on the other side of the fence is our distribution. So Adobe actually has a very large business in distribution. Um, you know, for the 2012 Olympics, as uh, my, the previous speaker spoke about with YouTube, we worked on the back end, getting all the content ready to get delivered to NBC and BBC 
but we can do DRM, we can do protection, we can do uh, also if you're deliver delivering over an IP network, we can help you with analytics as well. So again, topics for another day, but we try to think about the entire life cycle of content creation, content delivery, and content monetization. Going forward, the industry has gone through a shift. So in the past, we used to buy all the stuff. If you wanted something to work, you bought it all from one vendor. But we've moved into an IT-centric age, and we're starting to see really modern um, IT uh, APIs start to emerge, you know, service-oriented architectures. So what that allows us to do more than ever is to have best-of-breed products coming together. So we have uh, you know, over 200 partners that work with Adobe directly integrating workflow but one of the most exciting things we've done, I think the number's over 40, uh, we have this thing called content panels. Because one of the things you don't want to do if you're focusing on content creation is lose context. The most important thing is the story. You're a slave to the story that you're telling, and you want to be concentrating on that story. You don't want to be alt-tabbing into other things and trying to find rundowns or trying to find, uh, you know, where is that asset and engaging and moving of files. So the content panels are a really exciting part of what we've done with our partners, and you're going to see some of this in a moment. It allows workflow systems to be created under the hood, and quite often all the user is doing is double-clicking on a clip or dragging something, and it's presented right in the UI. So let me show you a little bit of that. These are the different areas. Some of the ones that are important for uh, workflow uh, were trialed last year at the Confederations Cup with our great partner EVS. So the Confederations Cup, uh, we worked with EVS, embedding their media asset management solution, representing the media directly to the users inside of the premier environment. Uh, delighted to say that looks like this is what's going to happen when we go forward and do the World Cup with exactly the same configuration. Uh, so sports broadcasting with partners is a key part of it. Um, example, I, I've listed some of the Sochi partners there. Uh, NBC at Sochi. Uh, ingested 18,000 files through Prelude and created over 700 rough cuts. But none of those actually went into Premiere. NBC on their sports editing side is an avid house. So it's really about adhering to open standards, passing data between different systems. So uh, an example of that, you're going to see a lot from EVS later on. They're going to focus on showing you their application, but here's what it looks like hosted right inside of a Premiere Pro experience. So the user, you can pretty much look at that and go, well, I guess I could just double click on that clip and work with it. The answer is yes. But in the background, what we might be instigating is movement of media between different storage systems. A whole range of things can happen using our APIs under the hood. So one of the things that's really important about file-based workflows, and part of the reason media asset management becomes really important, is if someone comes back from a shoot, it doesn't feel very important when you've got this little SD card. I've got the most important interview in sports ever here. Eh. I stick it in my laptop, which again is kind of anticlimactic in and of itself. Um, but if I don't add information, how am I going to use that content? So adding information is really important. We're going to touch on this throughout the uh, presentation. But I wanted to highlight one uh, sports partner that we have that's got a great solution. So we've got a product prelude that Matt's going to show you. So remember how weird this slide looks compared to what Prelude li looks like when Matt shows it. We've built an open platform where you can change almost all of the UI. So in this particular case, the partner Delta Tray, which keeps track of all of the backend information, such as who's playing, the contextual uh, activities that you might find in that sport, and so in this case, uh, a football match, and allows people, instead of typing for logging, just to click buttons. So the probability of you getting better information, more accurate, correctly spelled, in the right place, is greatly increased. I'm just going to play a little video inside of uh, this window here to show you not just a soccer example, but you know how would you use this for rugby or tennis? Oops, if I push the right button, I will. What we have here is the standard Prelude video monitor with the sport happening here. In this case, is the Rugby World Cup final from last year. This is what we've built on as a speciality. These are common used rugby phrases. They're all spelt correctly with any luck and. Here are the list of participants. What Delta Trade do is specialize in managing data. So we're controlling the data from this match. We're using that to populate the team sheets in here so people don't need to type them out. So when people spot something they think is worth logging, they hit the shortcut button and then can select from these keywords what things ought to go in and they appear automatically down here. So we've got a headline box at the top and we can free text or we can use keywords as well. They both work in that box and we save things and they appear in the marker list. 
the great thing about this is all of these keywords are done for you, so they'd be transferable for any sport. We've built something called the Sports Designer, so if you didn't happen to have rugby, you had tennis, you click tennis, and let's say it was Federer and Nadal in the final, and this was tennis, then all of a sudden in here, because we've selected tennis, we have different set of keywords that are good for tennis, and your participants now have gone from two 15-man rugby teams to two tennis singles players. And we will buy him a tripod to help shoot better videos. But uh, <laughs> no, I think this is a really important part in the file based age because the life cycle value of that content, obviously, with sports, the value is most important at the moment when it's all going down. But you never know when, you know, maybe you're, uh, you know, not in the Premier League and, you know, this guy's on the up and coming. You want to go back and find the footage of, you know, the first goal he scored, his first uh, hat trick in a game or uh, something that happened earlier on. So adding the metadata as early as possible, hugely important and a trend we think is absolutely crucial for media entities to survive and thrive in the modern age. So digging a little bit further. So if you take our products, well, one of the things we want to focus on today is that we touched briefly on the partners. We're going to dig in very deeply on anywhere. And that's the part that makes all of the tools not care where the media is. And that's very important. The other thing we're going to focus on is more and more of the devices. So we're going to actually show how you start to integrate tablets and devices to add more metadata to allow other processes outside of content creation to occur. Because if we think about um, content, there's areas outside of um, just the actual content creation. It's interesting listening about you know, the rights about if you show a corner flag, you, know, you can't do that. So there's a certain amount of uh, you know, legal approval, standards and practices, even in sport, that you have to adhere to. These people want to be in the mix. We don't want to have you know, real-time processes that actually have to create media for them to look at. We want them looking at the truth. And that's one of the things we're going to be able to uh, show a little bit later on. Things we're focusing on right now, so I was delighted whoever did the 4K lead-in, thank you. Uh, we actually lump that into Ultra HD, so it actually is more than just uh, uh, resolution. I'll talk about that. Um, if you hang around with engineers, you'll often hear them talk about uh, service-oriented architectures. Uh, we think that sounds you know, very techy, but if you tie all these things together, what we really think about is systems that are creating a creative service bus. I don't want to think about where my files are. I don't want to think that they're on file server X in directory Y in this name. I don't want to think about that. I want to search for words that are meaningful to me and find it. And the last part is distributing your content. How do we maximize the value but minimize the complexity? So historically, if we're selling stuff into other markets, we've done transcoding, we've done different languages and things like that. So these are some of the themes. And let's just dig in a little bit and we'll explain why we think they're interesting and why we wanted to share them with you. First is Ultra HD. So we talked about the resolution. Um, and one of the things, I'll actually put it into a context, and hopefully Sky doesn't get mad, because have you guys wound down your uh, 3D channel yet, or is it still going? Still going. Good job. It's great. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things, you know, just in terms of talking about it is um, stereoscopic was interesting, because it um, presented a new experience for the home, but I don't think anybody would say that the home adoption of 3D televisions has uh, met with the same expectations it had three years ago when people started talking about it. Just a show of hands, who has a stereoscopic TV at home? Shockingly high number. All, probably all Sky subscribers, there we go. Um, but one of the things we see with 4K is a price point thing happened. So we watched the Consumer Electronics Show. And the Consumer Electronics Show in January this year uh, Vizio, a TV manufacturer, released a 4K television for less than $1,000, which is a big marker for us. Uh, but I think that's going to be kind of, that's fine. But I think the interesting parts are going to be the higher frame rate. So for sport, high frame rate is good. You actually end up with a much more interesting picture. And for those of you who followed the news out of um, NAB, I'm showing down here extended dynamic range. So for the first time, we can actually deliver more color and light to the TV. Uh, Dolby is one of the innovators in this space, and again, it's all about bandwidth management. But Dolby actually has shown that inside of the type of connectivity you have to the home, you can deliver an extended dynamic range. Um, and one of the best quotes that uh, a colleague of mine made when he see, uh, saw this whole pipeline in action, your TV becomes a window. So high resolution, high bandwidth, um, high color bandwidth, high and a larger raster. But it imposes a lot of challenges. I've put up the cube in the corner for the geeks in the room, but just think about the color as being 
the visible spectrum of light, the smallest triangle being the color space that we work in today, and the larger triangle being the extended dynamic range uh, color space of uh, Ultra HD. So taking the small triangle and mapping it to the big one, pretty easy, it's a subset. But if you start managing and creating content in the larger color space, mapping it down to the small screen, if it's not done effectively, your stuff will look like total crap. And these two worlds will coexist for 15 or 20 years. So it's gonna take quite a while before we end up with a more simplified workflow. So actually we're contributing to this space. Uh, Lars Borg, who actually helped Hollywood figure out color with ACES, is actually working on this space. And all the work we do, we will contribute to both SIMPTI and the EBU in this space. So from file to fileless. So I have to give uh, Matt, who you'll hear later, coining the phrase fileless. So we don't want people to think about files. Like file-based workflows, it's like, hey, we've got a file-based workflow. Great. Um, but it didn't really change anything. So one of the things we want to start thinking about is how do we think be content-centric? Because if we think about you know, the tools we use, editing, logging, graphics, and devices we may have in our pocket, and we think about all the different tasks that you have to go through to create content, it can be challenging. If you thought about making point-to-point -point connections, there's a lot of arrows, and frankly, we don't have the time to build all of those arrows. It takes a long while to do that. Um, so one of the things that happens is Adobe Anywhere is like a unifying factor. It sits above all of the different products and creates connectivity, and Mike will explain this a little bit more. But at our best, what, would, what we want to create is this concept of all of these different functions just being pervasively connected to one representation of the media. So regardless of the device you're on, regardless of your bandwidth connectivity, I just want to see the stuff and add my bit. And if my bit's just saying, I'm the lawyer and I say this is good to go to air, maybe that's it. Or maybe I've just spent uh, you know, two weeks editing a half hour documentary on a particular player. I'm just as engaged, but I still want the same things out of the system. So media service oriented architecture is our shorthand for the creative service bus. The last part, or the last bullet, is you know, moving from distribution-centric to content-centric. So um, if we think about broadcasting, quite often the thing that pops to mind is a transmission tower. Or you start thinking about satellites. You start thinking about things. So that used to be distribution-centric. And quite often, the knowledge to create content sprung up around the transmission tower. So particularly in North America, that's exactly what you found. You know, wherever you had a transmit tower, that's where you had the infrastructure. Today, it's content-centric. So if you've got content that the world wants, it's connected. We saw that in the YouTube video. You know, everybody can really get to anything today. But as a content owner, you have to worry about a few things. We have to worry about, you know, changing the raster. You know, so how do you scale things up, scale things down? How do we change the frame rate? Even just the, you know, the 25 to 29.97 in North America, and we start adding in the 50 and the 60 and the 120, you know, it's all going to be a lot of work there. Audio is a huge thing, making sure you deliver the right languages. If you want to have a global audience, you have to deliver your content in the languages that they want. But in doing so, there's great revenue opportunities. There's also the more boring things that after I've generated a file, when I want before I play it to air, I actually want the right stuff in the content package, so I have to check it. And then, you know, depending on the type of content you're distributing, there may be uh, lawyers involved, as there often are, who have to sign off on it. So. We've looked at you know, what's happened today is uh, content owners and broadcasters are having multiple centers of excellence around the world, but uh, what's happened is they started evolving. I sent the file over there, and then they added the Spanish language uh, you know, dialogue track. And then you ended up with the Spanish thing over there, and the English one's over here, and the Portuguese one's down in Brazil, and they're all over the world, and nobody's got all of the stuff together. So one of the things that's coming out uh, that we're focusing on are content packages. So you may have heard of ASO2 or AS11 or DCP. Um, just think of those as baskets. And in that basket, I can not only put my video, but I can put multiple audio tracks, and then I can put a recipe in there that says, if I want Spanish, take this and this and play that out. So for us, you know, we're investing in this space, uh, and, and uh, we'll give you a sneak peek, but in a few days at NAB, we'll announce our support for AS11, uh, particularly using the DPP shim. So that's uh, germane to the UK because that's become the new delivery standard. For Hollywood, we'll also be able to deliver DCPs. I think over time, though, this model is even somewhat antiquated by design, so you'll see this change as well. Because what we're talking about is, if I want an HD master, I put that in the basket. I want an SD master, I put that in the basket. If I want a different frame rate, I put that in the basket. 
So you're putting a lot of content into the basket. But we start to think about what's happened is compute's become pervasive. I have more compute power sitting here than I could have bought for the price of a house seven years ago. So it's compute's just becoming more and more pervasive. So why don't we put the high resolution one in there and the list of instructions on what to do to it to deliver the other different versions. So this is an area we're focusing on as well. So we don't just want to be about versioning content. So with that, that's into my sort of preamble, all the good stuff. These guys get to do all the exciting stuff. I get to do PowerPoint. They get to do neat things with networks. So it is the platform, and this is really where we're, we're banking on it. We really think that the things that hang out at the end are going to be less and less important over time. So you know, as we go forward, there's never been a time in our industry where there's been so much concurrent change. There's so many things changing in how we do things. Um, but also, when you start thinking about it, there's never been a time where you've actually had a direct dialogue with your customers. You, know, you put something on the air, and you can actually see the tweet coming back. You know, your customers are engaged with you. And there's opportunities to really build on that relationship and make it tighter. So we want to work with everybody who's involved in broadcasting to further that. Um, in doing that, I think we were going to unlock more and more value of content. You know, um, I've had conversations with sporting federations that in the past, when they had tape-based archives, had demand for their content, but they couldn't cost-effectively deliver archival footage to people, even if they wanted it. So the promise of these types of networked, connected systems where we're using you know, just standard connectivity, you can unlock value in your content. Um, so we're going to go through a, a whole reinvention of how we do things. And it's really going to be more skills focused. We're not going to worry so much about where people are. It's really going to be less technology focused and more on the people and the content. So we hope that you guys just keep making the best content. One of the great things about sporting is the absolute passion with which people attach themselves to it. I know because I'm an F1 freak. Um, but our job is to really listen. And one of the ways that we've uh, built our business so far is by listening in times of change. So as we go through this, I really consider like our relationship with ADI is all about exploration. They're going to do things with our technology that we never expected. But if we listen and we respond, hopefully we come up with uh, new and interesting workflows that become you know, the standard for the industry.